TorahCafe.com. There's more to reality than meets the eye. In Judaism and in the world that we live in, we're constantly interacting on primarily three realms. The realm of action, which we're most familiar with, the realm of speech, and the realm of thought. Each one more personal and connected with the soul than the next. It's a fundamental belief in our religion that our actions influence material reality. The Ramchal, in his famous work, Mesilas Yesharim, says as follows, if a person will be pulled after the lusts of this world and succumb to them and be drawn away from God, not only do they lower themselves, they bring themselves down, but the world is tainted along with them. The same thing is true on the opposite. If a person withholds from their negative drives, they withhold from their lusts, not only do they uplift themselves, but they uplift the world. So we're used to the realm of action affecting things. And it's become more widespread, something that the Torah has taught for many years, that speech as well has a role in shaping reality. Many people, you see kids sometimes when they argue, the kid wishes something bad, he curses at the other person, he says something really nasty about the other person, I hope you blank, blank, blank. And the parent or another child will say, don't even say that, how could you say that? Why? They're just words. Doesn't do anything. The Baal Shem Tov, in his synagogue, he's the founder of the Hasidic movement, and in his synagogue he encountered two people one time in the midst of an argument. And in the midst of their dispute, one yelled at the other, I'm going to tear you apart like a fish. So the Baal Shem Tov gathered all those present in the synagogue. They all stood in a circle and put their arms around each other. And the Baal Shem Tov instructed them, close your eyes. When they closed their eyes, they began to shriek. They saw this person tearing the other person apart like a fish. Meaning that what we say in some realm actually exists. The Talmud teaches that Lashon Hara, speaking bad about somebody else, has a, a, a bad effect on three people. First one is the one who spoke it. Second one is the one who listened to it. And third is the person that it's about. So I understand when it comes to the one who said it, it has a bad effect because he shouldn't be talking about those things. And I understand when the person who listened to it, it causes a negative effect. Why? He shouldn't be listening to those things. But what about the person, the innocent guy, who it's being said about. Why does it have a negative effect? How could it have a negative effect if he's not in the room? He's not going to be insulted. The answer is that just by speaking bad about somebody else, it causes harm to them. The pinnacle of the year that Jews from all circles gather at the synagogue is Kol Nidre night, Yom Kippur. What's the first thing? What's the service named after? All the bad things we did? No. Kol Nidre. All the vows that I said this year. Speech. Speech plays a role. Speech changes reality. The power of speech was recently, within the last few years, done with, uh, experimented with study. Dr. Isaro Emoto from Japan, many people have heard of the experiment with water crystals. He took water from a spring and poured them into a vat, and one vat, people were saying all sorts of positive things over. They would say thank you, they would say you're welcome, they would say you're so nice. And over the other one, over the other container of water, they would say, you're such an idiot, I hate you, all sorts of negative things a drop of water was taken from each of these vats and frozen 
in a freezer by negative 25 degrees Celsius and left for three hours. Once that was finished, they took out the, the uh, droplets and examined it under a microscope between 200 and 500 times magnification. What they saw was that those ice crystals, which had positive things set over them, the ice crystals were perfectly symmetrical and beautiful snow-looking creatures, uh, crystals, excuse me. Whereas those that had negative things set over them, just ice, were jagged, all out of kilter. So just the speech over this water had an effect on the way that the crystals froze. There was also a similar experiment done by Israeli chemist Tomer Rebiev and physicist Arik Naveh with, um, with bean sprouts. One bean sprouts, one, one uh, control of bean sprouts were used, water was used that was said blessings over and good things over, and those bean sprouts grew, whereas the one that had curses set over it and negative things set over it did not grow. Now, take these experiments as you may, you know, everything is subjective, but just the idea, just the idea that the secular world is beginning to realize and it's beginning to become part of uh, actual research that people can partake in, that speech causes an effect in reality is something very novel, something 30 years ago that would never be accepted. So let's take it a step back into thought. David Einhorn is the Wall Street guru of an investment philosophy called value investing. What he, he attributes his success to buying optimistically when everyone else is staying away from it, is acting pessimistically towards a product. He invests when it's low, and he has the positive thought that it's going to get better. If you take a room of CEOs or very successful people, you'll see oftentimes they have a natural optimism and a positive energy about them. I spoke to a cardiologist friend of mine who told me a fascinating experiment was that, that he had heard about from one of his friends. He said that they took a, a study of children who were diagnosed with cancer, and a control of them, what, he did, what they did, was they had the kids play Pac-Man. And, you know, Pac-Man is the game where they have, like, that guy, and he's munching all the... It's from the 80s. And, he, and they said, they told the kids that pretend the little munchy things are your cancer. Those children who had that state of mind did exceedingly better in their results and in their progress than those who didn't have in mind. Everyone probably in this room has heard of the book The Secret or the documentary The Secret. So we see that the idea, the law of attraction, how positive thoughts breed results, is very much in vogue. The idea that positive thoughts, that positive thinking will bring good results, um, and that negative results, is, uh, negative thoughts bring negative results, is the, the core of cognitive psychotherapy. That you think good, if you think good about yourself, that you'll be empowered and you'll be able to change. So the question is, what does the Torah say? We see that secular society is already coming around, that they acknowledge speech plays a role in shaping creation, and that thoughts even can shape what takes place in reality. What does the Torah say? And the truth is, for us as Jews, we always have to look through the lens of the Torah. The Talmud, the Gemara in Nida, the end of chapter 3, says as follows. When the fetus is in the womb, of its mother, two things happen to it. Number one, it sees from one end of the world to the other. It's shown the entire world. And secondly, it's taught the entire Torah. It says, next, when the fetus comes out after nine months, an angel slaps the child on the mouth, and it forgets all the Torah that it learned. So I have a question. The question is, the Talmud only mentions 
that it forgets the Torah that it learned. But how come it doesn't remember what it saw? This, it, it says that it sees from this end of the world from the other end of the world. How come I don't remember what the whole world looks like and I, was, I saw it? And the answer is because without Torah, you can't see anything. Through the lens of the Torah is how we gain clarity to reality. In Jewish meditation, it's taught that without meditating on godly concepts, without meditating on Torah ideas, that the subconscious of a person remains unrectified. A person can't stop thinking. Should we try an experiment? Everybody up for an experiment? All right. When I say go, we'll, ta we'll take 10 seconds, and I want you to stop thinking. Ready? Go. All right, who's thinking? And, who, and who, who, who's not thinking, but thinking, I'm not thinking, I'm not thinking, I'm not thinking. <laughs> so the mind can't stop thinking. The question is, what are we thinking about? Our natural inclination is to think about the natural world at best, and at worst, to look at that natural world in a natural look, which is negative, which will be drawn down to negativity. We always have to have positive thoughts. The truth is that any positive thoughts will work. If a person wants to really excel in life, any positive thoughts will work. But Torah ideas about optimism are especially effective. Like the Talmud, the Gemara, and the Zara says, Ein toiv ela Torah. Torah is the ultimate good. Therefore, if we think concepts of Torah, or if we understand the Torah's principle of positive thinking, that will be the greatest force in order to accomplish that. Many of us may be familiar with the story from the Torah about Joseph. Joseph is the favored son of his father, Jacob. He's given a very nice coat. And he sent one day to go check on the rest of his brothers, see how they're doing. And we know the story. What happens is, you know, superficially they're jealous of him, and they end up throwing him in a pit. Now the Torah tells us something about this pit. It says that the pit was empty. There was no water in it. The pit was empty. There was no water in it. The Medrash says, isn't that a bit redundant? If it was empty, I know there's no water in it. It's empty. So the Medrash clarifies. It says, yes, it was empty of water, but it was filled with snakes and scorpions. In the Talmud, the Gemara in uh, Bava Kama says that water is symbolic of the refreshing flow of Torah wisdom. The pit can be compared to the human mind. The pit is the vessel of the human mind. If the vessel, if the human mind is not filled with water, the only other option is that it's going to be filled with snakes and scorpions. If we don't have the positive perspective in our mind, if we don't have Torah ideas in our mind, a rectified subconscious, what's going to be filling it? Snakes and scorpions. With our own thoughts, we don't have to fight off negativity. Many people, I've spoken to many people, and they said, you know, I'm so negative. I'm a negative person. I can't, I don't know how to get rid of these negative thoughts. And the truth is, we don't have to get rid of the negative thoughts. We just have to increase in positive thoughts. If a person has a vat of poison, and this vat, you can't pick it up, you can't dump out the poison, but you want to fill it, just stick a hose in there and keep adding water until the poison gets out of there fill our minds with so much positivity and so much Torah that the negativity will just disappear. Engraving Torah concepts in our mind through contemplation and meditation, we will only see things in the positive light with optimism and confidence. There's a classic story from the Talmud about Rabbi Akiva. 
Rabbi Akiva would travel oftentimes town to town. And he traveled with what you traveled with in those days. He traveled with a donkey to transport his things. He traveled with a rooster in order to wake him up. And he traveled with a candle in order to, that he can sit and study. So he's, he went on his way. He came to a village. And he starts knocking on doors for some hospitality. Knocks on one. Ah, we're full. Knocks on the next. I'm sorry. Sorry, Charlie. Next one, next one. And he can't find any lodging for that night. So what does he do? He has a mantra that he says to himself. A way of thinking that he lived by. He says, Kol da'avid rachmana letav avid. Everything that God does, he does for good. That was his mantra. That's what he lived by. Everything that happens is for the best. So he goes out to the field and finds lodging in the field. What happens that night? First... A lion comes and devours his donkey. Great. Great. Next, the wind comes, blows out his candle. All right, now he can't learn. Now he's just sitting in the dark. And then a weasel comes and devours his rooster. Oh, this is really a great night. But Rabbi Akiva had a mantra. And Rabbi Akiva had a perspective that he lived by. Called the Avid Rahman Latav Avid. Everything that God does is for the best. Everything is good. It's all good. So he goes to sleep, wakes up the next morning, and finds out that the village that he had been knocking on had been ransacked by the Romans. People had been beaten, people had been murdered. And if he would have found lodging in that village, he would never have survived. Moreover, if his donkey would have heard the commotion, it would have let out some howls. If his rooster heard the commotion, he would let out some coos. And if they saw a light in the field, the Romans would have come and attacked him as well. Everything Hashem does is for the good. And he lived with this principle, and that was the effect that it had. One thing that's very interesting and I'll throw it out there as sort of a Kabbalistic footnote. We know in Jewish tradition that there's a concept of gematrias. Gematria is a numeric equivalent that certain words or phrases that match numerically other words or phrases. For example, Aleph would be one, base would be two. Certain things that match up numerically are related to, are related to each other. They have the same essence. The gematria, the numeric value of Rabbi Akiva's phrase, called to Avi Rahman, Latov Avid, everything God does is for the good, has the numeric value of 611. Do you know what else has the numeric value of 611? The word Torah. If a person engraves Torah in their mind, if a person looks at the world through the lens of the Torah and through the Torah perspective, will be able to not only be positive, but see positive results in the world. Now, we understand the importance of positive thinking. However, what does Judaism say about how our positive thoughts actually affect the world at large? How does it affect reality? The secret as we discussed earlier, holds by a concept called the law of attraction. The idea that thoughts influence reality. The secret, the secret talks about a universal intelligence that responds to our desires and our positive visualizations. If you really want something and you truly believe in it, posits the book, it'll happen. Now, first of all, Whenever academia or the secular world says the universe or the universal intelligence, what they really mean is God. They can't say God because that's something for the theologians to discuss. But what they really mean, universal intelligence, the universe, is a sort of divine essence to reality as we know it what we call God. 
in the God world, in the world where God is interacting with us and watching over us, I can't say that the Torah perspective agrees 100% with the law of attraction. Because any whims or cravings or desire that we have, God's just going to grant it to us or it's going to appear out of thin air? No. However, there are some fascinating parallels that we're going to explore. How does, how does my thoughts, how do our thoughts create reality, change the fiber of reality? It's very much related to an idea in Judaism on the idea of trust in God. Trust in God. Trust in Hebrew, and as it's talked about in the philosophical works, is called bitachon. Bitachon means trusting in God. Now, it's different from a concept that we know called emuna, which is faith in God. What's the difference between faith, emuna, and trust, bitachon? So many people think that, one, that bitachon, trust, is just a more intense a more intense feeling of faith. One is faith, and one is really, really, really strong faith called trust. Bitachon is really, really strong emuna, in other words. It's a little bit different. To sum it up, emuna, faith, if we were going to encapsulate the entire idea, maybe to a sentence or two, it's the idea that we believe, we believe that everything is guided in the grand scheme of things. Whether I perceive something as good or that I perceive something is not good, I believe, I have emunah, I have faith, that everything has a reason, although I may not see the good in it at the moment, everything has sort of a reason. This is something that obviously breeds serenity, because whatever happens is meant to be. It's a good idea. Whether I, again, whether what I perceive as good is actually good, or, or I perceive it as good, is one thing. But I have faith that everything happens for a reason. Trust is a little bit deeper. Trust says, I have absolute certainty. I have absolute certainty and conviction that God is going to make things good. And not only good in the grand scheme of things, but good in a way that I can relate to the good. We have it, we're presented, in other words, we're presented with a certain situation. Person goes through a challenge, uh, somebody loses their job, for example, or is in a transition in life. A person with bitachon, with true bitachon, which is not easy to do. No one's saying that. But someone with true trust, true bitachon, says, it has a certainty that I believe, I know that God is going to do good for me, and not only good in a way that is good in the grand scheme, but a good in a way that I can relate to. There's a wonderful biblical narrative that really demonstrates the dynamics of trust and how it works, and further, how our thoughts create the reality in which we live. Many people, many of us are probably familiar with Moses in Egypt. And Moses, one day he encounters an Egyptian beating on an Israelite. And what does the Torah tell us that Moses does when he encounters this? He kills the Egyptian. Following that occurrence, Moses then finds two Israelites, two Jews fighting. That happens. Two Jews fighting. He found two Jews fighting. And Moses goes over, hey guys, what's going on? You're trying to break it up. And so one of them says to him, what do they say? You're going to kill us like you killed the Egyptians? The Torah says something very shocking after that. It says like this, Moses became frightened. He said, indeed, the matter has become known. And right away afterwards, the Torah tells us, Pharaoh heard of the incident and sought to slay Moses. So Moses becomes frightened. The, 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 the account, the story had become known. And Pharaoh, then it says after that, Pharaoh heard of the incident and sought to slay Moses. Why does the Torah 
tell us about Moses' emotional response. Moses became frightened. It's not something typical in the Torah to talk to, talk to us about our forefathers' emotional um, issues or struggles that they're going through, how they felt. Abraham was happy then. Right? Isaac felt nice. <laughs> Moses was scared. But when the Torah goes out of its way to describe something, it's meant as a lesson. First of all, it's a normal reaction. Wouldn't you be scared? Wouldn't the normal person, wouldn't even a great person be scared? It's a normal reaction. Why does the Torah have to tell us that? We could, we could probably assume that he'd be scared. So everything in the Torah is meant, every word, every letter, and even every crown on every letter is meant as an eternal lesson for all Jews in all places at all times. Why, why does the Torah, what's the eternal lesson that we're being taught by the Torah telling us that Moses was scared and then subsequently being taught that Pharaoh heard? In order to get the answer, we're going to preface with a short idea. The idea is brought by the Rambam, the famed medieval sage Maimonides, in his magnum opus of philosophy, the Mor Nevuchim, the Guide for the Perplexed. He says as follows, the human mind is intimately cre uh, connected with the active intellect, the divine intellect. Divine, this is a divine attribute independent of the human being. Our thoughts are influenced by this active intellect, and it also attracts energy from it. Meaning that there's a, a give and take in what happens in our mind and what happens in the world. The Rebbe, the Lubavitcher Rebbe, explains the juxtaposition of these verses in the Torah and tells us a tremendous lesson for our daily life. Again, the verses that are juxtaposed, Moses becomes frightened, and he says, indeed, the matter has become known. And then right away, Pharaoh heard of the incident and sought to slay Moses. The Rebbe says, these verses are juxtaposed, and the Torah indicates Moses' fear for the following reason. Moses' fear, his negative outlook, his thought process, is what caused Pharaoh to hear. Meaning, because of the fact that he became scared, the world became a scary place. Because of the fact that that moment, that there was a certain lacking in trust, a lacking in certainty, that things are going to be perfect, that things are going to be good in a way that I can see them as good, the world became a scary place. Because Moses was scared, because he was frightening, the world became a frightening place. Now, the assurance that our thoughts and that God is going to do good things in a way that I can perceive them as good is not an easy task. We're filled all the time with doubts, rightfully so. We're human beings and we live in a world where things challenge the way that we think. But when a person does it, the thought actually becomes the conduit to draw down God's blessings. It, the thought itself, the perfect trust that we have, becomes the utensil, becomes the vehicle that allows God's bounty, God's blessing to reveal itself, to show itself in the world. So through us thinking positively, through us thinking and having trust that things are going to be good, the reality will come, and that is through the conduit of the thought. Even to the undeserving. Even to somebody who, based on their actions or their day-to-day -day life, may not be worthy of God's bounty. Just the fact that they have the trust at that moment, with perfect certainty, creates the reality, creates the vehicle for that blessing to take place in the world. The Tzemach Tzedek, the third Rebbe of Chabad, was approached by a person who had a severely ill child. And he told him, a very beautiful phrase. He said, think good, and it will be good. Tracht good, it's signed good. Think good, think positive, and it's going to be positive. Now, the Tzemach Tzedek wasn't informing, giving him a pat on the back and saying, you know, 
Think good. Every, life's good. It wasn't wishful thinking. But he said, through your positive thoughts, it will influence that reality will actually be good. Anyone who's dabbled a little bit in quantum physics finds that we find a similar thing in the development of information, how, how the research is, is beginning to show itself. And that was something that was really brought out and publicized by The Secret. Nobel Prize winning physicist John Wheeler said the observer is essential in the universe to exist. The observer is essential for the universe to exist. Another Nobel laureate, Eugene Wigner, says that the conscious observer, specifically a person with free will, is necessary to act on quantum particles to bring them into a state of real existence. Meaning that existence doesn't exist until a free-willed being observes it and wills it into reality. Very similar to what we're talking about here. Just by the thought, just by thinking positively, thinking in the right term of things, it makes, it creates the reality that uh, is good, is desirable. Let's talk about a little bit the mechanics of how this works. You know, many of us, including myself and including Moses, aren't always 100% of the time able to have a perfect trust in God. It happens. But until that time comes, there is a, there are, there's an idea, some food for thought, how we can think, how our positive thoughts influence reality in a very practical way. When God created the world, he went from un, unbridled bounty, unbridled godliness, to a world that we find ourselves in today, to a realm that we find ourselves in today of, of constriction where godliness is not apparent. And this, this constriction or limitation, this veil, is very similar to what the physicists talk about when they talk about different dimensions of reality. How reality as we see it isn't the actual reality that exists. There's so much more to it than we're privy to. We have a very limited scope. The dimensions go as follows. The first dimension is one direction, length. Take for example. Okay, two dimensions is length and width. Right? Any photograph is, is an object that is the people on the photograph, the people on the photograph exist in the second dimension, just length and width, two-dimensional object. Just like a painting, same thing. If you want a, an example of a moving two-dimensional object, think of, you know, everyone remember from the 1980s, Mario, the first Mario that came out, little flat guy walking along, all he, all he can do is up, down, left, and right. For Mario, or Pong, we have to bring it back a little bit a few more years back. Pong. The tennis game where it's this, like these two little uh, flapping things hitting that, that circle ball. Not a round ball, but a circle ball, two-dimensional ball, back and forth with each other. So that's something existing in two dimensions. Now, to a two-dimensional object, the idea of a third dimension, of what we... Third dimension is the reality that we currently live in, is length, width, and depth, or height. A three-dimensional object. We live in a three-dimensional world. We, have, we can go this way. We can go all directions. We can go out. So for a two-dimensional figure, for Mario, we'll call him, the, the idea of a third dimension, of going, being able to go this way, that this is, incorporate, this is part of reality, is completely beyond his realm of thought. So what's the fourth dimension? That's right. One is a measure of length, one is a measure of width, one is a measure of height, and the measure of change is time. Time is the fourth dimension. Meaning, and again, it's a concept that we, can, we can't really fathom because we live in the third dimension, but if a person could look at the world or look at another person in the fourth dimension, you would see them as they were a minute ago and a minute from now, all existing simultaneously at the same time. Whoa. Not only would you see them as they exist a minute from now 
and a minute ago at the same time, but you'd see them from womb to tomb, from the time that they were born until the time that they die, all at the same moment. You'd see them all in one simultaneously existing moment. Now, if you think about this for too long, your head explodes. But just the idea that, there is an, that there's a concept called the fourth dimension, time, where all time exists, where all what we call time, which is really a veil, exists simultaneously at once. And if you take it a step back, everything that happened from the beginning of creation that will happen until the end of time it will be seen simultaneously all at one point if we could view the world in the fourth dimension. Past, present, and future existing all at once. Wow. Interestingly enough, in Jewish texts, this idea is brought out to a forefront. Rabbi Eliyahu Eliezer Dessler, in his famous work, Mikhtav Eliyahu, says something very interesting. When a person is born, he's placed under the concealment of time. After his passing, the concealment of time is, will be removed, and he will view everything simultaneously, and he will see that time is merely a veil, since everything was really one reality appearing altogether. Whoa. What's interesting as well is Dr. Raymond Moody, his famous book, Life After Life, bestseller, who in he interviewed and did studies, extensive studies, on people who had near-death experiences. Upon his research, upon speaking to them at length, what did they describe? What was the experience that they experienced in their near-death experience? Was a world that all time existed at the same time. All time existed at once in one simultaneous unit. So that's the fourth dimension. We're going somewhere with this. Don't, don't, uh, don't lose track yet. What would be the fifth dimension? We'll, we're going to stop there at the fifth, after the fifth dimension because I don't know about you, but I'm, this is getting... What's, what would be the fifth dimension? So if the fourth dimension, time, is everything that happened from the beginning of time until the end of time, all existing in one simultaneous point, the fifth dimension would be as follows. At every given moment, you have an option, and the world has an option. It doesn't have to be according to one timeline, or the way that things actually work out in the world of action. But at every moment, I could do like this, or I could do like this or an infinite amount of other possibilities. So at every moment, there's an infinite amount of possibilities of things that can take place in the world. Every single moment. That the timeline can go like this, or like this, or like this. Every single moment has infinite possibilities that can happen in that one moment. In the realm of action that we operate in, we can only have access to one timeline. In our thoughts, however, we have access to every potential at every moment. Meaning that when a person thinks positive about a certain scenario, he brings that potential future, that, possible, that possibility, one step closer to themselves. Through viewing the world in a positive perspective, again, at every moment you have an infinite amount of possibilities of what could happen in the world. Through thinking about the positive way, the way that you want it to, the way you would like to have it, you connect yourself more, you walk through that portal of existence, you walk through that portal of reality, you help bring it closer to tangibility in a way that you can experience. So thinking positive brings that potential closer to our real-world course of events. I'm going to close with a story, some food for thought. We talked this afternoon about positive thinking and how positive thinking shapes the world in which we live and how it can create a positive reality. This food for thought is just something to chew over, something to live with, about our purpose here in this world, life in general, and how we can start 
thinking positive and what can motivate us to start thinking positive in our own daily life. This story is actually a mushal, an analogy given over by the Baal Shem Tov, the founder of the, of the Hasidic movement. There was a certain gentleman who lived his allotted time in this world. He lived his 120 years and he passed away and went to heaven. And as he's walking up to the, the gates of heaven, you know, the angel is taking attendance. He says, all right, right this way, Mr. Epstein. All right, Epstein, great life. You did a really good job. Go right through these gates and enjoy your heavenly experience. So Mr. Epstein says, you know, angel, I, I have a bit of an uncommon request for you. My whole life, I've heard about the other place. I don't want to go there, like permanently, but I've heard so much about it. Could you just, could you just show it to me? You know, saw so many movies on it, so many TV shows, and, and they've talked so much about it. Can I just see what it looks like? So the angel says, mm, well, this is highly unorthodox, but, you know, for you, you lived a good life. Let me just show you. So they go down the divine elevator, and they look through the window of H-E double hockey stick. And in that window, Mr. Epstein sees something that blows his mind. He's expecting to see pitchforks and devils and goblins and lava and all sorts of hot, horrible people. What does he see instead? He sees the grand ballroom of a cruise ship. What appears to be the grand ballroom of a cruise ship. Maybe the grand ballroom of the Hyatt Regency. It looks a room like, just like that. And, on bo and there's a very long table. And at the long table are very well-dressed people on both sides of the table. And the waiters come out in very finely dressed clothes and place the food on the table and everyone's very excited and very hungry. And they take off, and the waiters take off the lid and the food is piping hot and everyone's mouth is watering. And everyone lifts up their hand, ready to dig in. But attached to their hand is a fork that's four feet long, and they can't eat the food because the fork is too long. So everyone starts screaming and howling and, and crying, why, why, why? And so Mr. Epstein says, I can't, Angel, I can't take the suffering. Please take me back to heaven. They go back to heaven. It looks like a very similar setup. Same grand ballroom of the cruise ship, same long table, same well-dressed people on both sides, finely dressed. Out come the waiters in tuxes with piping hot food. Of course, the food in heaven is glad kosher. And they place it on the table. They lift up the lid, and the food is piping hot, and everyone's very excited, and everyone's ready to eat, and everyone lifts up their hand in order to eat, and attach their hand as a fork that's four feet long, and they, and they can't eat. All of a sudden, in heaven, what does everyone do? They start feeding the person across from them. In our life, if we are only thinking about ourselves and thinking about what's going to be the next thing for me, how can I feed myself, how can I get the next pleasure, our life is going to be a very negative place. But if my life is about what can I do for the other, what can I do to help shape the world around me, how can I find my peace in the world that I live in, life will be a life of heaven. It's all about perspective. It's all about positive thinking. It's all about the way in which we view things. A little bit of homework for everybody that we'll close with before we have to move on is that... Not so much this week, because everyone's going to have probably a great week this, up, until, up until Sunday night. But when you get back to the, the grind of work and the hustle and bustle of life and the bills pouring in and the screaming children, let's try and change our perspective. And when we find ourselves in a scenario that looks bleak, that's a bit of a challenge, Try and think positive. And by thinking good, it will be good.